Now, I've always believed that music theory isn't really a set of dogmatic rules that we simply have to obey as composers, but instead really represents a way for us to understand and make sense of musical principles already in action. And, and I know music theory can be a scary topic for some composers and producers because they feel like it boxes them in or ties their hands in terms of what should or should not be done. Now, we've heard of many very successful composers who've made great careers for themselves without really learning how to read music. Hans Zimmer, uh, Danny Elfman, Vangelis, Irving Berlin, these all come to mind. But does reading music really equal understanding music? Which begs the question, do we have to know music theory, especially as production music composers? Well, we're going to talk about that. And to help me out with this, I have called in the big guns, Mrs. 52 Qs herself, Shannon Croft, who has quite literally written the book on music theory and is also an arranger, a pianist, a music director, and a music historian she's going to come help me answer this question. Plus, we are going to take a listen to a delicate emotional piano cue that has a variable tempo, and we're going to talk about whether or not that's okay in production music on this week's episode of the 52 Cues podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Cues podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about uh, industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects about being a working production music composer. Plus, we feature a cue written by you, a member of the 52 Cues community, and this week, uh, we're going to be taking a listen to Glass Lakes, which is a delicate emotional cue that contains a variable, uh, variable tempo, and that was written by 52 Q's community member Jim DeGritz, who got absolutely loose on last week's feedback thread, posted six Q's in one week, so you definitely want to stick around for that. But if you want to skip over the topic and get right to that Q critique, then uh, you can check out the timestamps in the description below. And before we get started, I must give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Q's who keep the podcast, the channel, and and everything here going. And because we are 100% community supported, if you like what I do here, don't thank me, thank them. But if you do want to help uh, help support us and you want to know how you can uh, keep the channel going, unlock extra perks like live streams, uh, workshops, feedback sessions, lesson discounts, and more, then uh, you can click those links in the description or stick around because we're going to be talking about that much more later in today's episode. So uh, music theory, it's, I don't know, it feels kind of like a dirty word for, for, some, for some folks. I think it's big and scary. And there's definitely some like academic elitism that goes uh, along with that. But I thought I wanted to an ask the question and answer it and talk about if we have to know music theory. And to do that, like I mentioned in the intro, I have to get, get some help here. And I want to uh, introduce you to my better half, Mrs. 52 Q's, Shannon Croft. Uh, let's welcome her to the podcast. Shannon. I feel so welcomed. Yes, bask, bask, bask. <laughs> well, first of all, I can't believe it's taken how how many episodes? Uh, this is our second year here. We're already on week right. 22 of year two, and I can't I can't believe it's taken this long to get you onto the podcast. <laughs> and uh, for anybody wondering, yes, we are in the same house. <laughs> yeah. He's up in the you know, studio, and I'm down here in my office, and this is how we roll, man. We we hop on Zoom more than I would like to admit, just to talk yeah. about stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it's uh, we talked about maybe having you up in the studio mm -hmm. uh, and uh, doing kind of a uh, that kind of thing, but to be honest, it was just easier because I'm in my space and you're in your space, and totally. so it was just easier. And this is you know where you do all of your Zoom calls, all of your work with clients, or if yep. you're. If you're uh, if you're talking to your folks, and uh, we you know we have a workshop coming up, which we're going to mm -hmm. be talking about right. a little bit later, which you are going to be hosting. That's right. But but like I said, I had to bring in the big guns because you have quite literally written a theory book, yes. two theory books to be yes. to be exact. And uh, just 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 let's let's talk a little bit about that, and then okay. we'll jump on the actual topic because the circumstances 
around you writing a theory book are a little unique. Can you, can right. you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Sure. You know, the first time I was in college, and there's a story that informs this one, but is not necessarily relevant. <laughs> My first time through college, I had a horrible time with music theory. I didn't come from a, like a high school that had had any kind of theory program. We didn't get that stuff. You know, we, we memorized our scales and, and played music and that was it. So when I got to college, I was a little bit behind the curve anyway, um, because of people who had had some theory in, in high school. So, you know, I, I was hanging first semester, okay, um, and then I was sick a little bit second semester, and I came back and no clue what they were talking about. Like, mm. not just, oh, I don't know how to spell a D major chord, but like, you're you're saying words that I don't understand. <laughs> like, your words <laughs> for this. Sentences. I, I, I don't I don't understand. So, um you know, kept pressing through or got through the whole theory program and just thought, <laughs> I feel like a little kid saying this, but <laughs> I'm never going to use this. So, uh, <laughs> but lo and behold, um, about 10 years later, I found myself in Memphis, Tennessee, teaching theory to a totally different set, like not the conservatory set, not the set that was going to go out and, you know, uh, be a band director or whatever. I found myself teaching young people, 18, college age, who had only ever kind of sat in their bedroom and played guitar. Hmm. And so not only was it like, oh, they don't read music, they don't know how it works at all. And so I was faced with the challenge of teaching a college level theory course to these guys who are not just starting from nothing, but they're starting from sub nothing, you know, um, they don't, they can't even read a scale. So how do you do that? Because by the end of their first year, I wanted to have them composing music, you know, and, yeah. and understanding that they didn't read music and all that. So what I did was I, I gave it some thought and I realized that the words we use for music theory are just what we're already doing. And if somebody can help you understand that, it's just putting the words with it. And then it sort of unlocks the whole concept. And so I wrote a book just very, very step by step. And by the end of the first semester, they could, um, you know, look at like a hymn, you know, that has four parts and they could tell what chords being played and they could read all the notes and all of that, um, which then we, we developed into composing over the second semester. So all of that to say, um, I am really great. And, and later at Full Sail, I taught the the, the same type of student mm -hmm. online, which gave it another, you know, level of how how can we communicate this? So um, I really love teaching folks who are talented, but not necessarily um, learned, I guess, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because it's not hard and it, you can grasp it. And I've taught thousands of students both in Europe and here and online and everywhere. And I've had one student in 20 years who just couldn't get it. So mm. the odds of you being successful at this are really good. <laughs> and, 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 you know, one of the things that we really encountered a lot, you know, either, either in Memphis or even here at, at Full Sail, mm -hmm. was the student from the non-traditional background. Sure, And, and the reason you had to write the theory book is because – the theory book didn't exist. I mean, we weren't going to trot out like the no. Costco pain or whatever. You know, we weren't going to no. trot out. As trot out. Go ahead. We used one called um, Music Theory for the Modern Musician something. I, I don't remember. And it, it took a good stab at, you know, trying to make it relevant. But it was definitely written from the ivory tower. I mean, mm. it was like, you know, I'm looking at it going, mm-mm. So... Yeah, so that's why we wrote. We had to write it because nobody else had written it. Yeah, and, and I remember we we because I helped like typeset it and I did mm -hmm. a lot of the uh, design Absolutely. work for it. And every time we we showed a scale, mm -hmm. then we we put the, it on the keyboard and put it on the guitar neck because right. you know I would say like half of the students at Visible Music College were guitarists and not yeah. keyboardists, and yeah, so being absolutely. able to relate that. Yeah, was so super we had important. to have the you know the fingerings. Mm -hmm. For the scale, because 
that's the only way to make that connection. And if you're not going to make the connection, then why bother? And, and I think that's what's really important and, 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 and the ultimate takeaway. And, and, well, tell you what, let, let's back up. Let me just ask you, do production music composers and in your involvement with 52 Qs and everything, especially with the new 52Qs.com, mm-hmm. you've gotten really familiar with the production music world. Yeah. And uh, I mean, obviously, just from being married to me and hearing about my cues and all of that stuff. But I would say that's been kind of supercharged since launching 52 Qs. Sure. Yeah. So let me ask you. As a rec- recovering, you know, music theorist, as a <laughs> uh, someone who's written theory textbook, music historian, masters in musicology, all of that, I could blah, put blah, all blah. the alphabet soup and credentials. <laughs> but for you, do production music comp- uh, composers do they have to know music theory? Well, what level are you talking about? <laughs> do I have to know music theory to make cool loops and fruity loops? Probably not. But if I'm at all serious about what I'm doing, yeah, you need to. And it's not that, oh, you have to get qualified to do it or anything like that. It's like if I was going to move to China, I don't speak Mandarin, I, mm, but I'm going to go over to China and I'm not going to speak the language and I'm not going to learn it, but I'm going to go over there and have a life. Yes, you can do it. But it makes your life so much harder and you're confused most of the time. Yeah, you can only get by so far like pointing, like pointing right. at that and right. grunting. You know, you can like, only get so far. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing this note and it sounds cool. So what note should I put with it? Right. You know, there's because there is a language of music, knowing that language just makes everything faster. You know, just um, so I can sit down and write a piece. I know I'm going to write it in A and I know I'm going to use this barred chord from the minor and off we go. So, so Whereas what would you say? if I didn't know theory, I'm sitting there going, well, you know, mashing. This this and, sounds and good. It, and, and hoping it works out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what what do you say to the uh what do you say to the the composer, the producer out there who wants to get into production music, which mm-hmm. means, you know, talking chords and, and mm-hmm. all of that? What would you say to them who are feeling maybe a little nervous and anxious about jumping into the theory side of things? Because maybe all when they think of theory, they think of like you know, Beethoven, you know, the the the, the composer, you know, right. and a conductor in front of a, an orchestra. And that feels super like going from making beats, you know, in FL Studio <laughs> right. to, to conductor like stage. The London Carnegie Philharmonic. Hall. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a big like a, a, it's a big leap. <laughs> so what do you say to those folks who might be feeling a little nervous about us saying you gotta learn the language? Okay. Um you don't have to be Deutscheski, you know, you don't have to be uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, but you do need to be able to speak the language. So, yes, there is a higher plane of existence in the music theory world. And you don't have to worry about that. What's really vital and essential is that you have the tools for what you do day to day. Because once you're solid on that, once you've sort of... um ingested that and you own it, you can add on things as you go. But you got to have the basic, you got to know how to construct a sentence before you can write a book, Mm. you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. And you you have to know the the basic alphabet and Mm -hmm. you have to know the sentence structure and, 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 you know, vernacular and what works and, you know, Mm -hmm. how things are, are communicated. Right. Which, um, sorry. Okay. Um, I was, I was just thinking that, um, you know, uh, the way a lot of people approach it who are trying to make it simpler is, um, they give you cheat sheets. Here's all the major scales. Well, I can't read music. How's this helping me? It's not, um, or, you know, I, you just have to memorize all the key signatures. I don't work like that. I start from, a, B, C, D, E, F, G. If you know the first seven letters of the alphabet and you can count to seven, we're good. You don't have to memorize stuff. You don't have to, you know, uh, now memorization comes with using. So eventually you're going to use this particular set of notes long enough that you understand that this is the key that we're in. But anyway, all of that to say, um, I'm not fond of cheat sheets and rote memorization and all of that. If you understand how it actually works together, like mathematically, um, everything's easier. 
Yeah. You, you, you talked about reading music, and uh, I listed off the name of composers, you know, mm-hmm. in the intro, Irving Berlin, which staggers the mind because that's still the top selling Christmas yeah. song of all time is, is White Christmas. And, and he's also idea- not, uh, you know, he's not writing 1645, you know. <laughs> Right. And also, you know, I, I, I've read articles that said like Wes Montgomery and Dave Brubeck didn't really read mm. music. Yeah. And so, which again is like, what? <laughs> because, right. you know, that's jazz and that's all, that's especially now it's all kind of academified. Right. Um, but well, I was, I was just going to say the reason they could get away without reading music, which is not the same thing as music theory. Mm-hmm. Those are not yep. the same thing. I'm sure we're going to touch on that. Um, but the reason they could do that is because they were working in, in the jazz area which is about pro- improvisation mm-hmm. and so if you're playing you know um if you're playing and you improvise something then great you know let's let's use that um whereas the traditional western music theory if you see notes written on a page you play those notes written on that page and that's it if not you're playing it wrong and so you know they could get away with not reading music again not the same thing as not understanding how it works it's yeah. just they're two separate skills. Sorry, and, go and ahead. No, no, I, that that cuts to the to the heart of what I, the point I'm 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 looking to make, which is seeing people almost like venerate folks mm-hmm. who don't read music as somehow yeah. like it's like that scene in Wedding Singer. You know, which is old <laughs> older movie where the guy picks up the guitar. It's Steve Buscemi. He's like, I'm amazing. Never had a lesson. You know, and kind of like bragging <laughs> on this. Like, which, which I understand, it's, a, you know, oral, sure. oral tradition and all of that. But um, folks who, who tout that I don't read music, another uh, production music composer, Christian Henson, you know, says, like, and he says, I don't really read music. But there is a deep understanding of music theory, music yes. principles that do and don't work. I guarantee you, yes. Hans Zimmer and Danny Elfman understand harmony. And yeah. understand chord structure and melodic construction. Mm-hmm. Whether they're going to crack open a Sibelius file and start, you know, hanging notes on a staff, right? That's different. I mean, parenthetically, they have people that do that for them, of course. But, but Shocker. you know, Hans Zimmer knows the notes of the names. Yes, you know, he knows the notes of the chords. It's not blind ignorance, right. As far as it's I not don't like know a monkey mashing means. buttons and coming out with a movie score, right? Pride it, and Prejudice. That's not right? how this works, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, and so I think people confuse that, don't you? Like reading absolutely. music equals music theory. No, two totally different things. When I got to college, remember I said I, I didn't have any theory background. I could read my ass off. Excuse me. I could read anything you put in front of me. No problem. But I didn't know anything about how it worked. I didn't know why the notes were chosen. I didn't have, you know, and so in college, they started saying, well, the B section changes keys. And I'm like, <laughs> Uh, um, hi, it's a B section. What's key? You know, so it, it really is. It's the difference between, um, understanding English and being a professional narrator of audiobooks. Mm. You know, it's two separate skills. It's, it's one is authoring and one is reading. And so, yeah. That's all I got to say about that. Yeah, no, I think you know <laughs> you, you you mentioned that music is a language, mm-hmm. and and there is a, a way to understand you know orally passing it down and just sure. being able to and, yeah. and so many amazing players and composers play and perform by ear. But you, go ahead, go ahead. But what happens when you marry those two things together again? Not necessarily reading music. But understanding why this harmonic motion works, what is a tritone substitution, you know, what is a median root movement, and how do you build an augmented chord, and, and mm-hmm. understanding all of that. Well, even understanding why would I bother to build an augmented chord? What what mm-hmm. is its purpose? What does it do? It leads to a different place, you know. Um, and I, I think there's two things going on. The first is those people who tout like, well, I don't read music, and I'm a successful composer. I think they're coming from the mindset that, uh, like you mentioned earlier, that music theory is a set of rules to follow. And that's not at all what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, when you get into the upper echelons of like four part writing in the style of Bach and counterpoint and in the style of Vivaldi and all this stuff. Yeah, there's some rules involved to do it right. But 
at the level that we're talking about, it's not about follow this set of rules and you'll get something good. It's just about having the vocabulary Mm -hmm. to do what you want to do. So when you hear something in your head, you understand how to get there, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, it's... I had a dear, it turned into a dear, dear friend, but started as a student in uh, Memphis uh, named Stephen. Fantastic black gospel player, just like I'm so jealous. Like, (laughs) you know, gospel (laughs) players are my spirit animal. I mean, just, oh my God. And so um, we got along really great from the start. And he would, I would walk in and he would be playing something on one of the practice pianos. Oh, Shannon, come listen to me. I'm like, oh my God, that's really great. Now tell me what you just played. And it's crickets. like crickets. I mean, he had no idea. And I eventually got to where he'd be like, oh, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I'll have you know that uh, Stephen went on and got his master's degree in music, mm-hmm. which is not an easy task. And it all came because he started to understand that it's not a bunch of rules. It's being able to talk about what you're doing. That's right. And with your with your peers and your colleagues as well, um, it's like this. I used to do a lot of live recording in the studio. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, one thing that you have to do in the studio is hum and sing, because that's the fastest way to communicate information. And so my my students at at Visible and at Full Sail were always like, well, I don't sing. No, I'm not talking about singing. I'm not, you know, you're not up there with the Celtic women on the stage with, you know, <laughs> whatever. Where did that come from? Um, uh, you've been watching too much Outlander. That's one of the True. That's true. <laughs> um so it's but it's about, you know, if you're sitting in the studio, you have to be able to drum scat, for instance, or um, you know, say to the bassist, "Hey, that went boom, doom, doom, ba doom, 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 doom. Let's go, doom, doom, doom." You know, it's much harder to say. Well, you played a C major right there, and it's so, 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 so. You got to sing, and so it's kind of like you got to be able to talk to people about what your piece is doing. Mm-hmm. You know, if that makes sense, it's the fastest way, just like singing in a studio or drum scatting or whatever is the fastest way to communicate that information. Knowing what you're talking about is the fastest way to have a conversation about a cue or something that's happening in music or, you know, everything that's coming out is minor right now. OK, cool. Right. What does that mean? So, yeah and, and, yeah. and that translates to, you know, if we talk about different moods and emotions in in production music and mm-hmm. we say, OK, uh, we need it. We need something um, that's tension, but with a little bit of hope. You know, right. how do you how do you communicate right. that? Well, if you don't you know, know your well, modes, there's, and- there's there's minor and there's diminished chords. And then I would I would throw in a, a Lydian raised four in the end mm-hmm. and boom, we're done. Yep. Yep. There we go. And the fact that we just went from minor chords to now diminished <laughs> and now Lydian again. It's and, and, and I don't sit down. I, I to be honest, I can't remember the last time I even opened a Sibelius, let yeah. alone did notation. Right. However, when I am uh, when I I'm in the DAW and we're, when I'm teaching, especially, mm-hmm. and I need to examine chord qualities, I will open Notation View in Logic. But sure, that's not how I I think. I don't no. think in plotting notes. I, I, I was always really terrible when I was studying composition in college at just like sitting down with a paper, staff paper and a pencil and just composing. I thought right. I was always way too busy and weird. And I, it wasn't until I was really able to settle into composing and music production in a DAW right. that my composition career blew up because mm-hmm. I understand all the musical things, but I'm not going to conjure them out of thin air. Right. Instead, I'm putting my hands on an instrument, I'm performing, I'm playing things in, and I'm bringing music theory in as a way to understand, okay, where can I go next? What mm-hmm. am I doing here? And what what uh, scaffolding exists under what I'm doing? And then when you bring in everything else, all of the different styles and moods and everything that, that is dictated by harmonic, instrumental, and rhythmic language right. and those to define what the style is, I'm not left to just guessing because exactly. that's not sustainable. Right. Oh, God, no. I mean, and yeah. you certainly can't write the volume of cues that you need to write in order to get the placements and be really successful after three, four, five, six years, uh, for sure. And it's a little bit like um, 
the Matrix, the original Matrix, mm. when they first exposing Neo to this idea and, you know, all that green numbers and stuff, mm-hmm. the idea is they could look at those numbers and see what was happening. You know, uh, they saw the lady in the red dress. They They could understand what was happening. And it's just like that. There's this thing going on over here, the the actual music being played, but you can look at or he you can hear it and understand what the matrix is. Matrix is you understand right. what's happening. It's not just like some magical. Ah. And then if you understand what's happening, like you just said, you can use that as a tool to say, oh, I I, I do want to do attention cue with a little bit of hope, so I'm going to use this, this, and this. Right. But and, that's and not I, the same as a rule where if you're going to do a tension cue, you have to use this, this, and this. Right. Not which the is, same thing. You, know, we, we, you mentioned Bach earlier. Well, Bach was doing just that. You know, right. Bach wasn't wasn't playing by rules. He was writing and composing. And he was, and he was so darn good at it that they named the rules after him. It's like they, the first person to get a disease gets it named after them. Right. It just so happens that he was so good at what he did that they went, oh, that's great. Let's use that. We'll call it Bach. Right. And they extracted all mm-hmm. of these rules based off of the compositional techniques mm-hmm. that he was employing based off of what was and wasn't working, yep. you know, musically. And right. so it came to define. And so music theorists later said, oh, this is what was happening. Fast forward to jazz in the 30s and 40s. Mm-hmm. We listened to a, 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 a composer like Charlie Parker. And, and you're like, oh, that's really, really com- complex. Let's extrude and extract right. all these rules and then give those to the academics and then turn it into this thing. But that's yep. that's not what Charlie Parker was doing. No, right? he was going... Char- Oh yeah, yeah. I, yeah he I, was he was I taking jazz this. standards, or well, he was taking standards like Broadway standards, mm-hmm. shifting the harmony around, mm-hmm. and so uh, he might hold on the five chord an extra phrase, right. and the chords are changing in the melody, but now it sounds like a reharmonization, yep. and and that's what was happening. That's what early jazz and especially bebop. It wasn't all this really complex like Lydian oh, right. dominant. All this it was just right. Shifting tra- very traditional harmonies around, mm-hmm. but it started with a deep understanding of how that functional right. harmony worked, right? So that they could create many more complex things out of it. Well, and you know, um, we all know blues music, right? Um, blues was actually popularized not by the the progenitors, not by the original guys doing it. It was popularized by the guys who could read music who went in and tried to write what they were hearing. Mm -hmm. And so what you hear in the difference between the actual early folk blues guys, like Blind Lemon, Jefferson, and some of those guys, Sun Sun House, um, the difference between that and like the... um, Like W.C. Handy. (laughs) Mamie W.C. Handy is the guy I'm talking about. Right. And Mamie Smith and Bessie Smith. um, The difference between those things is profound because it got put through the filter of... I'm going to try to write down what I'm, but we don't have a Western notation symbol for a blue note, you know, so all I can do is kind of do bleep, you know, and, and so. Yeah. Call it a flat three and then, you know, but it's not really, which is why Mm -hmm. blues piano sounds entirely different from blues harmonica and blues guitar. It does. Because harmonica and blues guitar can kind of bend in between, play those real true blue notes. That's right. That's right. Right. So, um, so I think, you know, the moral of the story is music theory does not mean reading music. So when you hear Hans Zimmer, you know, in an, in an interview and you hear other composers kind of lift him up and put him on a pedestal as I don't have to know music theory. No, he doesn't have to necessarily like have to be a, 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 a Sibelius ninja. Right. But I guarantee you, he understands harmony and the principles of music theory. Otherwise, the music wouldn't make sense. I mean, you can take right. music theory principles and put them onto all, nearly all of Hans Zimmer's music. Mm-hmm. And it all works. It's all super functional. Yep. And that's because we're using the words to describe what the music is already doing. We're right. not making a set of rules to determine what the music will sound like. Right. So, you know, um, it... it it's just putting the words to and understanding with what you're already doing. Yeah. Isaac Newton, you know, when he came up with his theories later confirmed as laws of physics, he 
physics is going to physics, right? Right. <laughs> physics right. is going to happen. He Apples are going to fall from the trees. That's right. He didn't right. invent gravity. He just came up with the words to describe what it is. Right. And a way to understand it mm-hmm. so that when inventions and things are getting made, you can use those principles, right. those physics principles to work in into your your uh, your crafts or your inventions or whatever. I, Absolutely. I'm, I'm guessing you know, <laughs> engineers use physics and, and all of that. Uh, sure. Well, um, so I think that's the moral of the story. Don't yeah. be afraid of music theory and don't equate music theory with having to read music or be a concert pianist or whatever. Totally but, different skill set. Yeah, but just, just, just wade, even if it's wading into the shallow end. And I tell you what, DAWs are so great at reinforcing music theory and mm-hmm. even if, even if you never open the notation view if you're looking at the DAW and the piano roll you're yep. still you're still processing music theory that's right and if you have a really good ear right now if you're listening to this or if you're watching this and you're like man I can compose but there's just something missing I I can't break into that next level well if you can marry some music theory principles to that then my friend, you, you're going to be unstoppable. And that's what happened with Steven. Yes. Steven, by the time he got his like gospel chops and his theory chops together. Holy cow. He's a beast. He's he is an a absolute beast. beast. Yeah. And so, uh, so hey, I don't know if Steven watched this, but hey, hey Steven, Steven, what's up? What's <laughs> happening? Um, but to be a, a, a composer in the DAW, uh, all those theory principles absolutely still apply. Absolutely. And, you know, um, you mentioned that I'm going to do a, um, a workshop coming up and I'm doing something new, which is, um, when I've taught these, these young people who have no background in music other than, you know, chunking through chords in their bedroom, um, my, my goal was to have them reading music within nine months. So mm-hmm. we definitely hit the music, the, the reading part pretty hard. Um, but I'm going to go completely notation free for this workshop. We're going to do it all straight in the DAW because it's the same thing. It's just a different way of, of look like literally looking at it. It looks different, but it's exactly the same thing as reading music and has a lot in common actually. Um, but we're going to do this whole workshop completely in the DAW, no music reading at all. And you're still going to come out at the end with like, okay, I understand how major scales work. And I understand how to find harmonies for all these major scales. And so it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Um, and hi, my cat just said hello. If you heard that, that's Alan. <laughs> is that, he's is that Alan. Yep. That's Alan Silvestri Rickman. And he is uh, offended that he's not in here recording with me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, so, so yeah, I'm glad you you mentioned the workshop. And so the workshop is really for uh, any composer who maybe feels a little bambi legs about music theory, mm-hmm. and maybe they understand, you know, you know, and, and maybe they're they're beasts in mm-hmm. in the DAW, but yeah, there's fe- they feel like there's something missing, and that workshop is for you. And that workshop is a week from today. If you're watching this, you know, right. uh, on Thursday, uh, what, what is tomorrow's date? Actually, the ninth. The, yes. uh, the workshop is June 16th, 2022. And if you're watching this, you know, way off into the future, then uh, that that workshop is available as an archive. And mm-hmm. this is one of the benefits of being a friend of 52 Qs. And so it's part of the subscription mm-hmm. and uh, the archive for that. You can sign up, watch the archive. And, you know, we've had, uh, we did a mixing mastering workshop. We had Marlon Gibbons last month do an amazing workshop on uh, on uh, the uh, survival kit for the working production yeah, music composer. It was really good. And, uh, I was so thrilled when you wanted to do a workshop for the DAW composer yeah. because I think uh, I think there's a gap there. I think mm-hmm. you p- folks either think I have to be freaking Arnold Schoenberg, you know, or <laughs> I have to be totally like I never want to crack open a music theory book at all. Right. But, like, but there's right. there's a spectrum in between, and so That's you right. don't have to be a theorist, but a little bit of music theory understanding I think is going to really help yep. help to elevate your cues to to a whole new level. Absolutely. And I will say that we also have a lot of composers in the community who actually know theory and understand, but the the next step for them is 
okay, I, I kind of know what I'm doing. How do I go further? What are the cool, like the augmented chord and how does it resolve in Tristan and Isolde, you know, and all this business. <laughs> but Wagnerian theory. <laughs> or like our uh, uh, music production recipes guy with the uh, bisected tenths. Oh, bisected like, tenths, yeah. What's a bisected tenth? And then he <laughs> said what he meant by it. I was like, well, of course that's a bisected tenth. <laughs> So anyway, all of that to say, um, we have such a wide range of composers in the community, and we want to meet everybody where they're at, whether you've been doing this for 25 years and you know everything there is to know about music, there's still a place for you, just like there is the guys who are getting started and writing some good stuff, but not really sure what they're doing. And so uh, we all help each other because we're better right. together. That's right. Together, we are better. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. Join us over at 52Qs. Uh, sign up to be a friend and uh, and you can get access to that workshop. Like I said, that is next next Thursday, June 16th. Am I saying that right? Is that, is that the right date? Yes, that's the right date. June 16th at 5 p.m. Eastern. And the archive is available even if you can't attend live. Or like I said, if you're watching this way off into the future, that archive, it's already there. You could sign up right now. And, and watch Shannon's workshop uh, on music theory. And, and uh, in, for the DAW composer, we're going to be doing everything in the doll, in the piano roll. And so I really hope to see you there. But but what what are your thoughts? How do you feel about music theory? What's your relationship with music theory uh, or even reading music? What do you think about uh, folks who who brag about never being able to, to read music as if it's kind of a badge of honor? I would absolutely love to hear from you. Please let us know in the comments below, and we earnestly, earnestly would love to hear from you. Well, Shannon, again, I can't believe it took nearly two <laughs> years to get you on the podcast, but uh, so happy, so happy that you can join us today. Yeah, this was really fun, and maybe I'll see you guys again in the future. Yeah, we, I mean, we have other workshop ideas. Like I, like I mentioned, she's a music historian, and one of the workshops that we're bantering around or batting around a little bit, can if I can maybe... Yeah, maybe the 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 history of microphones or recordings. Mm -hmm. Like, how did we get? Like, how? Why is? Why did Bing Crosby and the Rise of the Crooners? What what happened there? The, and the, the, the technology. Whole, the whole reason that Bing Crosby is a thing in Frank yep. Sinatra is because of a technological shift. Yeah, and that's and so, really uh, cool. Like, yeah. it wasn't like, oh, here's this great guy who's doing something new that we've never done before. It's, hey, now we have the technology to record this great guy who's doing something new. And so, and, if uh, that kind of yeah. thing is interesting to you, uh, th these are the things that we literally talk about, like in the car. We're yeah, so we nerdy. Are Oh, yeah, we God. are so nerdy. We're, we're definitely a match made <laughs> in heaven. Absolutely. Well, Mrs. 52 Qs, Shannon Croft, thank you so much for joining You're me today. You're very welcome. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. And then on the other side, we are going to be listening to Glass Lakes by Jim DeGritz. Uh, but first, uh, just a couple of, couple of messages from or, or from you're going to hear again from Shannon. We'll talk about you. I'll not talk about you, but we'll talk about it <laughs> on the other side. I think I need more coffee. Hey, y'all. I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52 Cues podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52 Cues isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. The best part is that the 52 Qs community is absolutely free. And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com.
That was Glass Lakes by 52Q's community member Jim DeGritz. And thank you so much for sending that along. This was submitted for our week uh, 22 uh, weekly feedback thread. And uh, I really enjoyed this really lush gorgeous, really gorgeous. Uh, the mix, everything sounded really good. Uh, there's some really low end, like sub things happening earlier in the queue, but a couple of notes. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this queue is because we, we are dealing with a queue that has variable tempos or tempi, I guess we want to, we want to be too, super proper about it, but, uh, various tempos and it's not just kind of stretching at phrase points but it sounds like it's actually slowing down and so th those are those are two different kind of ways that we can approach using different tempos in the same cue now the rule of thumb is it's a really big no-no to to change the tempo on the cue because you run the risk of changing the emotional uh, tenor of the cue or the vibe of the of the cue, the mood. And if you slow something down, then the mood slows down and the mood can kind of bottom out a little bit. So we have to be really careful with that because for in, in, in general, editors do not like cues which shift mood or emotion mid cue. So that's one that's one really thing we have to, to watch out for. And uh, the other way that we can use tempos or tempo fluctuations are at midpoints where things are feeling more like uh, rallentandos or retardandos, where things are kind of slowing, which is great. But then usually it would kind of snap right back to that tempo. So it's a retardando three and four and one and two and three and four. And then we're getting back. And so the former, where we're actually changing tempos in the middle of the queue, I think that's a big no-no for production music in general. Now, you're going to see that in underscores and for film scores, because film scores get to play by different rules. They are, uh, they are underscoring a scene, and they can get away with that. Because as the scene ebbs and flows, the music needs to ebb and flow with it right? That's what scoring is. But for production music, the, the ebb and flow isn't dictated by the music, it's dictated by the editor. And if the editor needs uh, something to slow down in the scene, they're not going to try to find a cue that has the slowdown in the point that they can use and then hope it kind of goes back. Instead, they'll just bring in a different cue that slows down the energy. Now, it's not going to sound as unified as an underscored piece, you know, like if you had a four minute scene 
it's not going to sound as consistently underscored, you know, if as if you were doing a custom bespoke score for this. Production music will zing off into another cue. But that's part of, of, of what makes production music kind of what it is, is we're giving editors if we're giving editors a single mood or emotion that they can edit to. I could see an editor having a real problem working with this cue because those tempos are fluctuating uh, and, and not just fluctuating at phrase points, but actually slowing down. So for the production music side of things, I think that's a huge no-no. And that is something that you actually asked in, in your uh, submission, you said, uh, here it's another minimalist piece. I have a question for the community. The track has a meandering organic tempo. Hopefully it works with the mood. I think it totally works with the mood. However, uh, he, he goes on to say, however, a friend of mine who is a TV editor told me he never uses tracks with non-static tempos since they are very hard to slice and to edit. Is this a common thing? Yes, it is a very, very common thing. Changing tempos. But the type of cue you've written here, I think does lend itself to some Rolentondos, to some slowdowns, so that again, one and two and three and slow it down and then back to the tempo. I think those are at specific phrase points and not every phrase point, but a really emotionally poignant part uh, could could absolutely absolutely work just make sure you snap back to the original tempo uh, the other thing that i would say about this is um first of all like i said the sounds and everything are really really working this ambient minimal piano but it is too long at coming in uh, clocking in at 4 13 we are firmly into the commercial release territory side of things where this would sound great like on a uh, on an ambient peaceful retreat playlist on spotify or something like that but four minutes and 13 is 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 way too long for your production music library consideration i think it's too long and considering how uh how a lot of this is somewhat uh, you know, iterative and we're just kind of repeating things, I think we could easily trim trim this down. And um, it feels also like it's a little bit too much, like it's all one energetic level throughout. I mean, we have a little bit of, of ebb and flow, but it, it's pretty consistent throughout, which is a real balance. Because on one hand, you know, you have to be able to kind of click through the, the track and make sure it's not giant, giant changes. And so I'm going to do that here. Just going forward, 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 backward, backward, right? So it's all the same. And so it's a real balance. It can't be so di dif uh, disparate between the low and the high sections, but I think we need a little bit more. And also some edit points. Uh, and they don't, it's not a tension cue. It's not action cue. You don't have to have big edit points, but the, those moments like where the tempo slows down three and four and maybe a little edit point there and then, then coming back. So I would have liked to have seen a little bit more done as the cue progresses, but still keeping in mind that it's, it's an ambient cue. It's very minimal. There's not a lot happening. So I think if you just condense your arrangement, then it's not going to take us, you know, two minutes and 40 seconds to get to this density. It's going to, we're going to be able to, to step through our energy levels a lot sooner. And then finally into, into the button, we definitely want to give a little bit more of a definite ending here. This is a little drawn out, kind of zinging off into an, an into another, uh, another idea. And then not ending on the one chord. And so uh, this would, uh, from from the libraries that I've worked with for this type of cue, this would be a rejection. In fact, I wrote a cue similar to this. It was this very kind of emotional, uh, dramatic type of uh, underscore type of a cue. And I, I submitted it originally with this kind of plagal half cadence unresolved four chord, because in my mind, artistically, that kind of made sense. It's just, it's unresolved, uh, unresolved energy. But the publisher absolutely kicked it back and says, you got to hit the one chord, Dave. Like You just got to hit the one chord. And don't you know when that was used? It was used during a, a master's coverage one year. It, 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 during a feature story, and then that one chord 
title card, fade to black, cut to commercial. And so, uh, so, so yeah, I definitely want to hit the one chord. And I think you could probably have ended the cue just a little bit earlier. And then go back to that, whatever that, that whatever your one chord is and in the opening. Um, and so I don't think, unless I misheard. That is the one chord, isn't it? It is the one chord. I got to tell you, coming coming into that, because we've kind of gone, that's like it's some sort of optical illusion or aural illusion. Here at the end, it almost sounds like that doesn't feel like one because of the harmonic shenanigans that came in right before that, uh, and so I would just I would just take out that uh, 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 that just take that out. I don't think we necessarily we necessarily need it. But uh, Jim, thank you so much for sending that along. Like I said, um, Jim got absolutely loose. He wrote uh, no fewer than six cues that he submitted, and he mentioned. Um, from his uh, Platinum Jubilee weekend marathon session, uh, the Platinum Jubilee being uh, like the Queen Queen of England, her birthday, right? Uh, I, I read a lot of, uh, or I saw a lot of articles about it, but uh, thank you so much for submitting that. This was for our week 22 uh, feedback thread, and every week we put a, uh, a thread up and, and composers just like you submit their cues to it, and uh, we all kind of jump into the community and get lots of feedback. So thank you so much for sending that along. And again, to join the 52 Qs community is free and we would absolutely love to have you. So head over to 52qs.com and sign up. And lastly, like I said at the beginning, this none of this would be possible. 52 Qs, the the, uh, the the channel, the podcast, none of that would be possible without the support of the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Qs who help keeps the lights on. If that's something that you're interested in and want to help out, then, um, I mean, the patrons is just a dollar, and then we go all the way up into, uh, you know, mastermind classes and, and weekly feedback threads and different su uh, subscription tiers. All of that you can check out at 52Qs.com. But that's going to do it for me. I, I really, really appreciate you. Thank you for finding me however you found me. And uh, as always, I hope you had a stellar week and I look forward to seeing you next week. And until then, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2022, Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Cues community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Cues.com. 